our self-portraits. It's so funny, in Wisconsin, people say, why do you keep drawing yourself? I mean, you must really have a massive ego. And it's like, look at the way I draw myself, you know? When I draw other people that way, they hate it. I'm the one guy that doesn't mind looking, you know, horrific. Anyhow, um, yeah, I've really gotten shit for doing self-portraits. And I think that's really odd. And I also say that they seem to be the ones that people buy. And, you know, sometimes artists think about that. <laughs> Anyhow, I have three portraits here. Two are self-portraits, and one is featuring that guy. Um, this one over here is called Got to Get It Out of My Head. And in a way, I'm embarrassed to have done it because I've got this theory that if you do something stupid enough, I might round the corner and become very intellectual and deep. And that's why I feel like this. I mean, it's like, how do you, I don't really have to explain it. You know, you have ideas, they're driving you insane. You want to crawl out of your own noggin. I know it's almost like one of those Russian teacup kind of things. But in this case, I did, um, I merged them together, you know, through the magic of an eraser, which I use as much as a pencil. And um, here's my prop. People will go like, what are your inspirations? And I'll say, well, it's these photos on this stick here. <laughs> Where's Brian? Take you know, people love things on sticks. Huh? When it's on a stick, it's okay. I, anyhow, we don't have to talk about technique, but, you know, months seem to pass when I'm doing this scratching away. My method, I mean, the romance of uh, the way I draw is more akin to being a dentist. You know, I'm right in the face, and there's a lot of scratching noise, and sometimes I have to use razor blades. And then I go to bed, and every night I have a dream, and it's me scratching away on a drawing an inch outside of my eyeballs. It's like, Jesus, you're unfair to me. I mean, I do this all day, and that's what my dreams are. Can't I have a little bit of fun? <laughs> this is a sister piece called Double Self Portrait with um, Trust Issues. And again, in that case, it was a good, it was a good title. And uh, I didn't bring the photos from the Midwest, so we don't have to chat about that one. Well, let's do another giveaway from a Norwegian standpoint. In fact, let's do three. I have three Ole and Lena joke books. <laughs> and uh, very valuable from the Nordic Nook in downtown Stoughton, Wisconsin, the community that's three blocks long. I don't know if I should, well, while we're doing the drawing. Yeah, read it. I'll, I'll do a joke. You um, pull a number. Okay. Ole says there are two seasons in Minnesota. Winter and under construction. <laughs> okay, that's number 429. four. Four twenty-nine. Four twenty-nine. All right. Yay. Yay. Okay, this is volume seven. Let's see what the joke I can find here is. Oh, Sven expl Sven's the third one out. I think if they have threesomes, Sven's the guy that always shows up. Sven explained to Oli the difference between a chorus girl and a sewing machine. Said Sven, the sewing machine ha only has one bobbin. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not planning this. What, what? 466. You, you, you women here, what, what is a female bobbin? Right there. Anyhow, okay, we'll read one more and then hopefully move on to something a little more fruitful. Fruit, fruit. <laughs> Oli is a little gullible. Once at a county fair, he paid $2 to see the invisible man. <laughs> okay. 469. 469. Way in the back. Okay, way in the back. Pass it back. Read the joke. Now we'll move to this self-portrait. And it's not a self-portrait. See, some of the ones where I say it's myself, I have to fess up that it's me. For a lot of my self-portraits, I'm just the model for the portrait. So when I do the drawing, I don't look at it and say, there I am. I say, look at this guy. And this is part of my low self-esteem series I've been doing for quite some time now, dealing with, you know, a middle-aged man that doesn't particularly like himself. I think of him as a kind of mostly a clueless, not really dangerous character that just doesn't know what's going on. Some of you may have seen this piece of mine at the Denver Art Museum last year. When you left the King Tut show, it was right there, so you might have accidentally seen some of my shit. <laughs> this is called, um, called Self-Portrait with Place New Mountain Homes, where I have, it's like going up I-70, except that my head is as big as the mountain. And I thought of this piece as a sister piece to that. The whole idea was, a lot of these, it just comes from one notion. It's like, I'm at that age where people wearing Bluetooths and talking to themselves, I'm never going to get used to that level of madness, you know? So I wanted to do, do a guy with a Bluetooth. And in a way, doing these drawings, it's not just like drawing, it's kind of like inventing a character. So anyhow, I found a photo that looked kind of guileless that I wanted to draw, and then I figured, okay, he does a Bluetooth, and then he starts adding more technical stuff. And the technical stuff is the cra craziest new modern stuff, but at the same time, it's got kind of a 50s clunky feel. Retro Futura, for example. And then I realized he probably got the good idea to be solar powered so he'd be sufficient. So he kind of surgically had solar panels put into his forehead. And then he was an idiot. Somebody sold him a surveillance camera. So wherever, wherever he goes, he has a camera pointing right at his eye, which obviously seems to be freaking him out. So, <laughs> what are your influences? These are my influences. 
And so um, the thing I'm pleased with here, even though it's silly and kind of like a science fiction drawing, is that I, I kind of turned the texture of the skin into stuff that has little conduits underneath and, you know, they kind of rise to the top. So if you look at it closely, that's the one thing I kind of like about it. So anyhow, tech savvy and solar it is. <laughs> okay, let's see. The next one. Um, ba -bum -bum. Let's go over this way and we'll finish up over there. We're moving along, okay. Should we do another giveaway? Oh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, okay, let's go over to this one over here. Um, God, you guys are patient. Must be a, a slow Friday night if this is what you're doing. <laughs> you, know that, you know that or I'm, just, I'm going to be tired in just a few minutes. Um, this drawing is kind of unusual. And with this show, I kind of tried to do some things that were very, very conservative and some things that were the normal things I did. In this particular case, um, I've really never done a drawing with a lot of figures. And um, in, in near Stoughton, where I live, about 10 miles away, is a town called Utica. And it's an unincorporated town. And the community of farmers that live in Utica function as their own little community. They don't really have a town other than this incorporate, unincorporated crossroads. They have a bunch of country churches. They have a bunch of bars. And if you talk to the farmers there, they go back to like 1840, exchanging the land. They just exist on their own. Nora store, go to Mo Nora. You go there on uh, Sunday morning, and every oh. farmer in a 40-mile radius is there with a Bloody Mary. And on it goes. Anyhow, they have one festival of the year, and that is the Utica Fest. On Saturday, the Utica Fest is mostly horse pull, and on Sunday, it's a tractor pull. And tractor pull is essentially very much like going to the drag races. And so we decided to go out there and take some pictures um, for a drawing. And I haven't had the nerve to go right up to people and say, I'm an artist, I'm going to do your picture. So we kind of did it surreptitiously, just shooting around. And a lot of times I would have Anita pose, and I would focus on things behind her. So I have all these, <laughs> these photos of Anita with all these folks. <laughs> but anyhow, it might be a little wooden, but uh, we're definitely going out there next year and really going to work. But this is um, a thing I thought might be interesting. I'll leave it over here. I don't know if it'll balance up there. But those are all the characters I work from. And what kind of freaks me out is that, you know, I didn't have to do very much. <laughs> By the way, Screaming, Screaming Norwegian is the name of um, one of the tractors, a drag racing tractor. I couldn't fit the tractor in because of aesthetic reasons. But anyhow, and also, you'll notice this fellow is looking out in the Renaissance manner, establishing, you know, desperate eye contact with you, the viewer. Um, and this guy, I, you know, he wasn't wearing a hoop. Hooters hat. I threw in a little Hooters. Uh, I should tell you, this particular community, they have one god, and the god is Matt Kennesett, the NASCAR driver, number 17. When we first moved there, we were always like, what's this number 17? And people just, you know, I mean, it was like saying something good about Tebow, you know? People wanted to kill you. Um, but anyhow, yeah, that's Matt Kennesett. He's the god. There's a museum in the nearest town to Matt. So anyhow, if you come to visit us, bone up on your stock car trivia. There's a couple kids in this, on this that haven't made the, the, the drawing, but they might make an appearance in the very near future. Um, okay, let's do an apropos giveaway for that. This is from um, a store in downtown Stoughton. Um, it's a can of fish balls. <laughs> and they're in bouillon. Uh, Anita and I have suffered a lot, but the worst thing we probably had to do was when we went to the fish ball place, because the people that harvest the fish balls have to wear earphones, because the screams of the fish are, are so excruciating, even when they're in water. <laughs> and when they do it in the winter, they're under ice, and you can still hear the poor little things. It's just sad. But then they get real lazy and sleep in baskets. So anyhow, let's pull a number for these uh, collectible fish balls. 441. 441. 441. Hey! All right! <laughs> okay, so now we'll go to this little fun corner over here. Um, I, I've uh, obviously always liked to draw signs. I love the way people communicate. I love the way signs communicate. You know, it's kind of like Walt Whitman said, signs and advertising were the poetry of, of the American um, of the American people. And uh, I just love billboards. I always have. I think a lot of it has to do with Ed Ruscha and stuff like that. But I, after I did that Signs of Nature, I got thinking, Signs of the Future? What would Signs of the Future say? And I thought this is what they would say. Jesus Christ, what next? And then the little signs say, fuck if we know. <laughs> Anyhow, that didn't play too well in Stoughton, where I got to show this only once, and that was at a fundraiser for the Chamber of Commerce at a supper. <laughs> <laughs> I did bring the Utica piece out, too, and a local realtor said, 
I know three of those guys. <laughs> so anyhow, if you're, Anita and I are going cross country, we're probably escaping from one of them. Uh, let's see, over here in the corner, I have my little show and tell bunch for that. I don't have much show and tell for this, except again, in, you know, I'm so progressive that with the internet, the one thing that's fun is getting to experiment with type styles. There's my research on that particular piece. <laughs> the piece over here is called Neighbors. Again, um, Ivar's been pushing this show like I'm a real political cutting edge dude, and I'm like, oh god, do I have to come up with like politics and stuff like that? So anyhow, I can say this drawing is a metaphor for our relationship with Mexico and illegal aliens. It's not, but hey, <laughs> I just wanted to draw some hands on a fence. It's probably closer to a sitcom or something. But I'm kind of pleased with the way it worked out because I've done humor for so long that when I do something that's more creepy, it always has a little bit of an effect because you know, it's hard to be funny these days. You know, you got to slip into creepy. And one of the first people I met when I moved to Wisconsin was the cartoonist Linda Berry, who lives in a small town about 20 miles away from me. And I said, God, Linda, I mean, it was so great to meet you because it's like having the craziest aunt in your life being your acquaintance. And I said, I'm, I'm afraid my work is going to get dark when I move to Wisconsin. And she said, dark is good. So there you have it, from Matt Greening's girlfriend. <laughs> Anyhow, here's my visual for that. It's pretty easy, actually. It's, um... Photos. <laughs> so over here is another one. This one um, is one of my American Dickhead series. I've only done four Dickheads, and there's well, there's about a million to go. <laughs> but, you know, you got to stay above water. This one's called um, Stump Stump with the head of Jamie Dimon. Jamie Dimon is the CEO of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Now again, I didn't really, you know, he's a dickhead to me because Chase was my bank. It's like, you know, Chase Wells Fargo. You know, you, of course you want them dead because you've banked with them and they've destroyed your life over and over. So two years ago I had a bad checking experience and um, I wanted to do something horrible to Jamie Dimon ever since. Anyhow, I felt like dra drawing a stump and I felt like decapitating Jamie Dimon and putting him on the stump because it had a nice medieval feel to it, you know? And then it, it behind there's burned out, very simple burned out Chase logos. I kind of think of this as my Cormac McCarthy piece, because it's got that gloom and doom. Again, here's the things I work from. High tech, a stump, a logo, and Jamie himself. <laughs> so here's the thing. I thought, this drawing's not interesting. And whenever you do topical drawings, sometimes they, you know, don't make sense. I, I finished Sarah in April and thought, she's not going to be on the wall till um, October, late October. What's going to happen? As it turned out, I think Sarah worked well because I saw on Greta Van Susteren a few weeks ago and she was saying, I can't run for president because I'm a shoot from a hip maverick kind of person and the presidency would restrain me. So it's like, let's get this straight. Being the leader of the free world would cramp your style so you can't do it. It's like, that crossed the line into madness, you know? And it was the perfect apogee, the coming together of, of, of pop celebrity and politics and what Aaron um, Sorkin calls the, uh, the glamorization of stupidity. So I think that's worked well. This was the same way. A couple weeks ago, the Occupy dudes in New York marched to Jamie Dimon's house. And the mayor of New York had to defend him, saying he's a wonderful man. And Saturday Night Live made a joke about him a couple of weeks ago. So that drawing's topical. And so when you look at that drawing, you can say, Bill the artist, he's really hip. <laughs> but like everything I do, it was an accident. This drawing over here is an accident, but uh, it's not an accident. I made it, but I can't look at it. It's too hideous. <laughs> that's our friend Eric Cantor. Those of you in the arts know that he probably wants to pull all the money from artists and NPR and everything quicker than anybody else, which is really saying something. Plus, he's a fascinating bobblehead of a man. When you see him talking, he's head bobbling around. So I wanted to cross him with a Giacometti because it seemed to make sense. Or I thought maybe a tortured Egon Sheila. I decided to go for the Giacometti, and so it's called Eric Cantor Metti. These are basically my two sources. Presto changeo! Oh. Oh, let's see, we do have some giveaways for this. And just a few drawings to go. You guys are amazing. Um, actually, I got a Wisconsin giveaway. It's a little drawing called Pile of Cows. So it has nothing to do with these guys, but it does have a nice absurdist Midwestern kind of feel. So, And it's got a lovely gold frame as well. It was drawn in uh, 1995, so probably worse. <laughs> oh, yeah, they grow in value. If I happen to get killed soon, you might be able to make some money. Off of it. I don't think so. I think you got to die much younger than this. So you know, don't don't bother. Pull out a number, young lady. Four thirty-one. Four thirty-one. Four thirty-one. Right there. Okay, that's not bad. What a score. Okay, gang. Your patience is admirable. Two drawings to go. I'm going back to the corner. 
<laughs> you know, oh, one great thing about living in Wisconsin is that Anita and I had to go to an art opening for a year. Uh, on Friday nights, it's fish fry or stay at home. Those are the options. Um, okay, this drawing here in the corner is kind of an odd man out. A lot of you are probably art students or have been in art school. Some of you have probably indulged in the world of art speak and know what that entails. And uh, I'm one of these guys that never was comfortable with speaking that way. And we used to call the people that did true believers because you've all probably met someone that's incapable of not talking in art speak. And when I was young, I thought, wow, they're really smart. And then as you grow up, you realize, oh my god, they're really pathetic. They can't snap out of it and just be a regular human. Anyhow, I wanted to draw a hand and I wanted to draw a remote. I mostly wanted to do a big drawing of a hand. That's what started. So I drew the hand in the remote. I was just going to call it, you know, life or God, because my life is basically me and a remote. And my wife, of course, and our lovely cat and my 93-year-old dad. So, okay, that's why I couldn't just call it life. Then I got to thinking, why don't I make an art speak remote, which could solve all your art problems with one handy-dandy thing. So you can see the different things that are written on it. You can start by contextualizing or decontextualizing. You can have content down here. You can have process. You press the Emerge button, because, you know, as an emerging artist, it's hard to be, you know, people tell you you're an emerging artist, but an artist doesn't know when to emerge. And so many of my art friends that were good emerged, and they saw their shadows. And then they went back in the studio. <laughs> Seven years passed. It was just the saddest thing. Seven years that they could have had a productive life. Anyhow, there's a lot of little things on here. There's apps. Um, there's a digital ear remover, so you can do the Van Gogh without actually hurting yourself. And it's just full of statements you might find familiar. Um, I'm a little embarrassed by it. I kind of did it to... I'll just kind of be shocking in that when I do this kind of art where I'm like an idiot savant, you know, I, I want to do something to say, you know, I do know about the art world. <laughs> I have a little poem here on the info ease. I think this is kind of like my opening thing. Maybe I'm turning into an amateur poet of sorts, or maybe a Kelvin Trillin, who I love. The info ease says, who to know, where to go, what to say, who to pay, when to think, where to drink, how to speak, when to freak, where to show, who to blow. <laughs>